Welcome to Audiobook 365 Stories. It is only four o'clock, but it is winter and the sun has already gone down. There are no clouds in the clear, cold sky to reflect its light. The air has a little pink color, and this color is also on the snow that covers the ground. I live in a small house by myself on a wide, empty land. No sounds reach me. I see the empty ground covered with white snow. There are a few black spots where the snow is thinner on small hills. The snow fell and slid down, so it is not as thick there. A few birds are pecking at the hard ice that covers the small ponds because the frost has been here for a long time. I am feeling strange. I am alone, very alone in the world. Bad luck has come over me and made me weak. I know that I am going to die and I feel happy. I feel my heart beat. It is fast. I put my thin hand on my cheek. It feels hot. There is a small, quick energy inside me, and now it is almost gone. I will never see the snow of another winter. I believe I will never again feel the warm sun of another summer. With this thought, I start to write my sad story. Maybe a story like mine should die with me, but I feel like I have to write it. I am too weak in my body and my mind to stop myself. When I was strong and healthy, I thought my story was too scary to tell. Now, as I am about to die, I feel like I should tell it. It is like the dark, secret forest that only dying people can enter, and I am like Oedipus, who is about to die. What am I writing? I must focus. I do not know if anyone will read these pages except you, my friend. You will get them when I am dead. I am not writing this only for you because it would make me happy to write about our friendship in a way that is not needed if only you read what I write. So, I will tell my story as if I am writing for strangers. You have often asked me why I live alone, why I cry, and why I am so silent and unkind. When I was alive, I did not dare to say. But now, in death, I will tell the secret. Others may not care about these pages, but to you, Woodville, my kind, loving friend, they will be special. They are the memories of a sad girl who, even when dying, is still thankful to you. I know your tears will fall on these words that tell about my bad luck. And while I am still alive, I thank you for your kindness. But enough of this. I will start my story now. It is my last task, and I hope I am strong enough to do it. I have done no crimes. My mistakes can be forgiven. They did not come from bad intentions, but from a lack of good judgment. I believe few would say they could have avoided the bad things that happened to me. My life has been controlled by need, a terrible need. It needed stronger hands than mine, stronger than any human force, to break the strong chains that have kept me, once full of joy and love for goodness, now full of sadness that will only end in death. But I am forgetting myself. My story is not told yet. I will stop for a moment, wipe my eyes, and try to forget the heavy sadness I feel now by thinking about the stronger feelings of the past. I was born in England. My father was an important man. He lost his father when he was young, and his weak mother raised him. She gave him everything she thought a rich nobleman should have. He was sent to Eton, a famous school, and then to college. He was allowed to use a lot of money from a young age, so he had a lot of freedom and independence, which is what many boys get at a big school. 
Because of these situations, my father's feelings and actions could grow. They could grow as good things like flowers or bad things like weeds, depending on what they were like. Since he was always allowed to do what he wanted, his personality became strong and clear at a young age. If someone watched closely, they could see that he had both good qualities and things that would cause him trouble. He often spent a lot of money on things he wanted in the moment, calling these strong wants his passions. But sometimes, this spending showed his great generosity. Even when he focused on helping others, he still got everything he wanted for himself. He gave his money, but he never gave up any of his own wishes for his gifts. He gave his time, which he did not care much about, and his feelings, which he was happy to express in any way. I do not say that he would have been selfish if his own desires were in competition with those of others, but this situation never happened. He was raised in a life of good fortune, with all its benefits. Everyone loved him and wanted to make him happy. He always tried to make his friends happy, but their happiness was also his happiness. If he paid more attention to others' feelings than most boys did, it was because he had a friendly nature and could not be happy unless everyone else was as carefree as he was. At school, competition and his natural abilities made him stand out among his classmates. At college, he stopped reading books. He believed he had other things to learn that books could not teach him. He was ready to start his life and was still young enough to think that studying was just something to keep boys from getting into trouble, not something important for real life. He was more interested in things like riding horses and playing games. So, he quickly joined in all the silly things college students did, but his heart was too good to be spoiled by them. It might have been carefree, but it was never cold. He was a sincere and understanding friend, but he had never met anyone who was his equal or better. No one helped him learn new things or made him think deeper. He felt he was quicker and smarter than those around him. His talents, status, and wealth made him the leader of his group, and in that position, he was not only content, but proud, thinking this was the only goal worth aiming for in the world. In a strange way, he saw the world only in relation to his small group of friends. He thought that any ideas that were not popular with his friends were strange and out of style. He became very set in his ways, but was also afraid of not agreeing with the only ideas he considered correct. To most people, he seemed to not care about criticism and looked down on public opinions. But while he acted like he was above everyone else, he was secretly worried about fitting in with his group. Even though he was their leader, he never shared an opinion or feeling unless he was sure his friends would approve. But he had one secret hidden from these dear friends, a secret he had kept since he was young. Even though he loved his college friends, he did not trust anyone to understand or be delicate with his secret. He was in love. He feared that if his friends knew how strong his love was, they might make fun of it. He could not stand the thought that they might not take it seriously and think it was just a small, passing thing when, for him, it was the most important part of his life. There was a gentleman with little money who lived near my father's family home. This man had three lovely daughters. The oldest daughter was the most beautiful, but her beauty was only a part of her good qualities. 
She was smart and kind. Her name was Diana. She and my father had played together since they were children. Even when she was a little girl, Diana was a favorite of my father's mother. As Diana grew up, my father's mother liked her more and more. Because of this, during his school and college vacations, they were always together. Novels and other things that teach young people about feelings before they really have them had a strong effect on my father, who was very sensitive to everything around him. When he was eleven years old, Diana was his favorite playmate, but he was already talking about love. Even though Diana was almost two years older than him, her upbringing made her seem more childish. Especially in understanding and expressing feelings, she accepted his warm words of love with innocence, not knowing what they really meant. She had not read any novels and only spent time with her younger sisters. How could she know the difference between love and friendship? When she finally understood what their relationship really was. Her heart was already attached to her friend. Her only worry was that he might find someone else and forget about the promises he made when they were young. But every day, their feelings grew stronger and deeper. This love had grown as they grew up, and it had become a part of every thought and feeling my father had. Only death could end it. No one knew about their love except them. Even though my father was afraid of what his friends might think if they knew he loved someone with less money than him, nothing could change his plan to marry her as soon as he had the courage to face the challenges he knew he would have to overcome. Diana was truly worthy of his deep love. There were few people with such a pure heart and real humility. She trusted her own goodness and believed in the goodness of others. She had lived a quiet life from the time she was born. She lost her mother when she was very young, but her father devoted himself to raising her. He had some unique ideas that influenced how he educated her. Diana knew a lot about the heroes of Greece and Rome and those of England from hundreds of years ago, but she knew very little about what was happening in the world around her. She had read very few books by modern authors, but her overall reading was extensive. So, even though she seemed less aware of the ways of the world and society than my father. Her knowledge was deeper and built on stronger foundations. Even if her beauty and sweetness had not captivated him, her understanding would have always kept his attention. He looked up to her as his guide, and he loved to feel humble in her presence. When my father was nineteen, his mother died. He left college after this happened. And for a while, he stayed away from his old friends. He moved close to Diana and found comfort in her sweet voice and tender affection. This short time away from his friends gave him the courage to stand on his own. He felt that even if they made fun of his plans to get married, they wouldn't dare to show it once he was actually married. So after getting the consent of his guardian, which took some effort, and the approval of Diana's father, which was easier to get, my father married Diana around his twentieth birthday, without telling anyone else about his plans. He loved Diana very much, and her kindness had a charm for him that made him think of nothing else but her. He invited some of his friends from college to visit him, but he didn't like their silly behavior. Diana had shown him a new way of seeing life. He had become a man, and he was surprised that he ever joined in the silly words and ideas of his college friends, 
or that he was ever afraid of what they thought. He ended his old friendships, not because he was changeable, but because those friends were not good enough for him. Diana filled his heart completely. He felt like, by marrying her, he had gained a new and better soul. She taught him what the true purpose of life was. Through her beloved lessons, he left behind his old ways and slowly became a good man, an important member of society, a patriot, and a true lover of truth and goodness. He loved her for her beauty and her kind nature, but he seemed to love her even more for what he saw as her greater wisdom. They studied and rode horses together. They were never apart and rarely let anyone else join them. So, my father, who was born into wealth and always had good fortune, reached the very top of happiness without the difficulties and disappointments that most people face. Everything around him was bright and sunny, and beautiful clouds hid the harsh reality underneath. From this high place, he suddenly fell when he was happily thinking about his good fortune. Fifteen months after they married, I was born and my mother died a few days after my birth. At this time, my father's sister was with him. She was almost fifteen years older than him and was the child of his father's first marriage. When their father died, this sister went to live with her mother's family. They had rarely seen each other and were very different in personality. This aunt, who later took care of me, often told me about how this tragedy affected my father's strong and sensitive character. From the moment my mother died until he left, my aunt never heard him say a single word. He was buried in deep sadness and didn't notice anyone. For hours, he would either cry or fall into a dark, scary mood. It seemed like everything around him lost its meaning, and only one thing could bring him out of his still and silent despair. He would never see me. He didn't seem to notice anyone else, but if my aunt brought me into the room to try to wake him up, he would immediately run out, showing signs of anger and distress. After a month, he suddenly left the house without telling anyone where he was going. He didn't take any servants with him, and he left the area without saying anything. My aunt only stopped worrying about what happened to him when she got a letter from him sent from Hamburg. I have cried many times over that letter, which, until I was 16, was the only thing I had to remind me of my parents. The letter said, Forgive me for the worry I have caused you. But while I was on that sad island, where everything reminds me of the one I have lost forever, I was under a spell. The spell is broken. I have left England for many years, maybe forever. But to show you that I am not completely selfish, I will stay in this town until you make all the necessary arrangements. When I leave this place, don't expect to hear from me again. I need to cut all ties that I have now. I will become a wanderer, a miserable outcast, alone. Alone! In another part of the letter, he mentioned me, as for that poor little child whom I couldn't see and hardly dare to mention, I leave her in your care. Take care of her and love her. One day, I might come back for her, but the future is unclear. Make her present life happy. My father stayed in Hamburg for three months. When he left, he changed his name, and my aunt could never find out the new name he used. She could only guess, from little hints, that he went through Germany and Hungary to Turkey. So, 
This strong spirit, who had made everyone who knew him feel interested and hopeful, seemed to disappear. From this moment on, he lived only for himself. His friends remembered him as a bright light that would never return. The memory of who he had been faded as the years passed, and he, who had once been a part of their lives and hopes, was no longer thought of as being alive.